Okay, so hey guys, it's PSL here, and you may be thinking, what on earth is this? F1 Manager on a Tuesday. I thought they came out on a Saturday. And yes, it yeah, it's coming out on Tuesday. That's very weird. Um, basically, quite a few people have been... A lot of people have been asking me this a long time to try and increase the upload frequency of F1 Manager. Try and do it two times a week, three times a week. One person I remember asked me to try and do this daily, which no way was that going to happen. But I'm, the, you're going to have a Tuesday upload of this series, and you're also going to have a Saturday upload of this series. This is only going to last for this week. Um, no, it's going to last for this week and another week later on. But basically, I want to get F1 Manager to a close, because it is going to be ending very soon, F1 Manager. Um, it's going to end on a high, and I've got all sorts of stuff planned out for the end. But because of that, I want it to end at a time that's convenient for me, hence the increase in upload frequency. But this series is carrying on for now, so don't worry about that. You're getting this video up on a Tuesday, and you're getting your Saturday upload of F4 Manager. So it's just it's going to be two videos this week, and two videos um, on another week later on. So with all that sorted, let's, um, let's head on and see what news there is before the next race, which is the German Grand Prix Hockenheim. Fantastic race where Neil McEwen won last year, so that's an exciting race, but we've got to see what news there is um, before the German Grand Prix. Okay, uh, right, I forgot I need to announce something this series. Of course, I was too busy trying to address why on earth I'm, I'm uploading on Tuesday. I need to address, um, obviously last episode we saw my engines. I've now negotiated Mugen Hondas instead of Mercedes-Benz for a free, I think it was two and a half, three million cost-cutting saving. So th that's why I've done that. But also, I need to confirm some more stuff this episode. And what I'm going to confirm today are my three personnel, like three main personnel. So my chief designer, my technical director, and my commercial manager. So my chief designer for next year is Neil Oatley. He's the only thing, or the only person I should say, not thing, that's, that's very rude of me. Neil Oatley is the only person who I haven't slashed because... Although we need to save costs, Neil Oatley can produce the best chassis on the grid. We saw what we were like in 2000, where we had a great driver lineup, great engines and etc, but a poor chassis. I think a chassis is one of the most important things in the game, actually. Um, so that's why Neil Oatley, we haven't slashed him. He's the only person to remain unaffected from Paul Stoddart's cuss cutting measures. Technical director, obviously at the minute we've got the best man in the business, Ross Braun. And Ross Braun looked two and a half million annual salary. I mean, he's worth every penny, but... We've had to make some cost cuts, unfortunately. And next year, we've still got someone who's very good, very highly rated. It's Gustav Brunner. He's not very highly rated, I'm, I'm sure is what you're wondering. He's highly rated by me. Obviously, we had him as our technical director in... 1999. Now, since then, we had Mike Gascoigne in 2000, who some people were speculating was sabotaging us. He was building faulty cars, overfueling, overfueling our cars, all sorts of stuff. Um, and some people were speculating that he was sabotaging us. And then, f fast forward to this year, we've had way more car reliability issues than we've had any year with Ross Braun. Gustav Brunner did a very good job with the race uh, the race strategy. He did a very good job with the car setup. And generally, no complaints about Gustav Brunner. I've no idea why we got rid of him. Because there was nothing wrong with him. He was brilliant at his job. And look, look how much cheaper he is. Only 80 grand a year. And he did nothing wrong in 99. I don't know who he's with at the moment. I think maybe Sauber or Prost. But he's coming back to us. And he's a Minardi Legend may be too strong of a word, but he's been at Minardi before, and he was great when he was with us in 99. I'm sure he'll be great with us in 2002. Now, finally, our commercial manager. This year, we got Stefano Domenicali. A great guy, very good at his job, and he's Italian, which is very important um, 
for the Italian team, obviously Minardi being an Italian team, it's very important, I feel anyway, to have an Italian running the commercial side of it. But next year we've had to get rid of Stefano Domenicali and we've got Massimo Cusimano, another blast in the past. He was our commercial manager in 99 and he arranged all sorts of sponsor contracts that are still on the car today. If you look, PlayStation, which is one of our two title sponsors on the car, he arranged that, he did. Massimo Cusimano, that was pretty much the last thing he did before he left the team. And look, he, he only wants $25,000 a year. Stefano Domenicali wants nearly 20 times that. And Massimo Cusimano, again, he was very good in 99. He did nothing wrong. And he's arranged, mass, you know, big deal sponsor contracts, which are still with us to this day, as well as many merchandise agreements he he arranged and he's still Italian quite frankly there was no reason to get rid of him and he's such a good cost-cutting saving why not get him back the old Minardi team in 99 was great we punched way above our weight we got four points in 99 which considering the car was amazing why do we need to change our personnel but anyway that's that's our news obviously next episode I'm gonna be announcing the brakes and electronics and then the episode after that the announcements you've all been waiting for my drivers for next year will be coming out so that's how it's going to work um but yeah there's my news we've got to see the news of the other teams and again this game never fails to amaze me again benetton sports systems at bar this game it's exceptional Oh, okay, statement from Sauber, and I've said throughout this entire series, Sauber have never made a groundbreaking announcement. It's always been very boring, very safe, very conservative. This is the time, I'm sure, Sauber, they're going to have announced something amazing here. No, they haven't. Marco Fessa, as their commercial manager, they're going to be keeping him as their commercial manager. But, it's not a bad announcement. It's not really anything interesting, the commercial manager isn't that big of a deal but there you go I mean another reasonable safe and conservative announcement from Sauber once again okay new components deal for Benetton what on earth could this be uh, Brembo brakes okay so the worst brakes in the game and the ones that we had in 99 um, and haven't had since we've had AP, bra uh, AP racing brakes since but Benetton gonna be using Brembo's next year that's not really that good for them, but hey, I mean, if your own if your own company refuses to sponsor you, of course you're going to have to get worse parts. That's a fact. Oh, okay, that was all the news. Actually, that was a good time to announce uh, my designer, commercial manager, and technical director, because hopefully the episode won't be too long because there's no other news really. Wasn't it Marco Fesser at Sauber? And Brembo's for Benetton, that was it, wasn't it? Oh, and Benetton Sports Systems, Sports Systems for BAR, but... Hockenheim. Now, although we know we haven't got Mercedes-Benz engines with us next year, we've got Mugen Hondas. And in fact, Mercedes haven't signed an engine deal with anyone at the moment. Um, I think there still might be some slots there, possibly. But, Hockenheim. It, it was, it's been a... On paper... This is one of the best tracks for us. Look at those long straights. And we've got the most powerful engine in the game. This this track on paper plays to our strengths massively. But in 99... in 90, Well, obviously in 99 we didn't have Mercedes engines. But in 2000 last year we weren't... We were pretty quick from what I remember. We were pretty quick but... Uh, we weren't... But, we weren't as quick as I feel we should have been. I mean Damon Hill got overtaken by Johnny Herbert within the last two seconds of the Grand Prix, it was ridiculous, but... It's a track which plays very well to our strengths on paper, and it's Mercedes' home Grand Prix, and... We've had a good partnership with Mercedes, a good two-year partnership, and hopefully we can sign off on a high with Mercedes by getting a win at their home race.
Oh, okay, this this isn't good. Hackland's awaiting recovery. As you can see, Colfard is still out on track. Hackland's awaiting recovery. So what on earth has happened to him? Engine failure. And Mercedes' is home race. Oh, that's a dilemma now, because I don't want to use a whole new engine just for qualifying. Unless I use the same one for qualifying and then risk it going in the race. Do you know what? That's created quite a dilemma for Mick Ackerman now, actually. Okay, so skipping on to the end of practice, and... These are some interesting practice results. Colfard only a tenth of a second behind Hakkinen. That's something we got to watch out for, and Hakkinen in qualifying. I think we're going to have to give Hakkinen a downgraded engine. I think we're going to have to give him a first model engine just for qualifying, just because... I can't, I can't use a whole new engine just for qualifying. So, we'll have to see about that. We've got a Schumacher in third. It's not Michael, though, it's Ralph. How Ralph Schumacher's been able to get into third is surprising. Um, I mean, it makes sense, because the Supertech engine is the third most powerful one on the grid. So it makes sense that he would finish behind the Mercedes, and logically, he'd finish behind the Ferrari as well, but... Hmm, I don't know, Ralph Schumacher was very quick last year, and hasn't really proved that so far this year, but at the minute, third, that's very good. Pedro de la Rosa with the Ford z has got fourth, which is astonishing. Schumacher fifth, Lamarie sixth, Frenson up in seventh, hopefully Frenson can finally score a point. Um, and I really, I think that's pretty much it in terms of the truly interesting and baffling results. Um, part of the well, yeah, I mean, John Lacey in 18th, and considering the Arrow's engine is by far and away the least powerful one on the grid, for John Lacey to be quicker than both Pross and Pedro Diniz in the Sauber, Lacey, once again, is doing a very good job. And it's great, last year he was at Benetton, teammates of David Coulthard, and John Lacey looked rubbish compared to Coulthard. Now this year, once you stick Lacey next to Genet, at least he looks amazing. He looks like one of the best drivers on the grid. But, I mean, that's just perspective. Um, but, yeah, no. now I've got a dilemma for Hakkinen. Um, I think he's not going to finish, certainly not on pole position in qualifying. Um, but, yeah, speak of which, we'll have to get on to the qualifying results. So qualifying for the 2001 German Grand Prix around the legendary Hockenheim circuit has ended and there are quite a few changes from the norm and so we better go through them. On pole position is a Minardi which is no surprise considering the dominance they've shown earlier on this season and the power advantage they have while using the Mercedes-Benz engines. What is surprising is that David Coulthard is on pole position. Now this is partially down to the fact that David Coulthard has a newer model of the Mercedes-Benz engine and that's because Hakkinen lost his model after it expired during free practice. So not only was Mick Hakkinen running on an older engine with less power, he was also at a disadvantage, he had less track time than his teammate and so Hakkinen's setup is all over the place compared to Coulthard's and we could see a good scrap between Hakkinen and Coulthard unless Minardi can fix Hakkinen's setup, in which case we should see Hakkinen possibly beat his teammate for by no means the first time this season. But either way, we should see an interesting battle at the top, and for the first time this season, it might not be Hakkinen dominating. In third place it's Michael Schumacher, which has essentially become his home this season after he's qualified there so many times. And Schumacher, despite not having to run an older engine unlike Hakkinen did, he still set a lap time nearly two seconds a lap slower than Hakkinen, not to mention three and a half seconds slower than Coulthard. But despite that, Michael Schumacher was still three seconds a lap quicker than his teammate Heinz Howard Frentzen, and Frentzen, who's had the unluckiest season it's possible to have, has qualified in fourth, so maybe his luck can change here. Giancarlo Fisichella in the BAR lines up fifth, which is no surprise. What is a surprise is Pedro De La Rosa in the Jordan using 
a very underpowered Ford ZTEC engine, has somehow been able to qualify his car in 6th, which is absolutely exceptional. Jacques Villeneuve, again in a Ford ZTEC powered car, lines up in 7th, ahead of Patrick Lamarie in 8th, who arguably should have easily beaten the two guys in front of him. Ralph Schumacher, who was 3rd in practice, is 9th in qualifying despite using the 3rd most powerful engine on the grid, but he did line up ahead of the other Jordan of Jarno Trulli. Stephen Watson was similarly matched to his teammate as Watson was in 11th, with Mika Salo in 12th and Eddie Irvine in 13th. Alexander Wurtz is in 14th, Damon Hill in 15th, Rooms Barrichello is in 16th. Jean Alesi in the Arrows is in 17th, which is highly impressive considering that the Arrows have the most underpowered engine on the grid. And with this track being so extremely reliant on straight line performance, for Jean Alesi to line up 17th is exceptional, and that doesn't sound good, but that is astonishing because he's ahead of Olivier Panis, Sarazan, Zanardi, Deniz, and finally his teammate Marc Genet who all of them, bar Genet, were using more powerful engines. Although with Genet being the slowest once again in qualifying and saying a lap time over two minutes being the only guy to do that, just shows how much better of a driver Jean Alesi is than Genet. Okay, so here we are on the race strategy screen and even though in qualifying we were so much quicker than everyone else, I've got quite a few just dilemmas and issues to deal with right now because Hakkinen, we he's already used two engines already and we could leave Hakkinen on the first model engine but he's going to be extremely underpowered compared to, well, at the very least his teammate and I mean, I, I don't know whether to stick him on a fourth model engine he seems fine on the first model engine and we've only got a limited amount of fourth model engines. So I feel like because we need to replace Coulthard's parts, we'll just give him the best parts. And surely we want an even amount of engines left at the end of the season of fourth model engines. So I feel like, in all honesty, we may as well give Hackenden. In fact, we may as well give Hackenden a third model engine, so then we'll be left with an even amount of them as well. But. I don't know. I'm stuck in a dilemma. I reckon we'll we'll replace. Oh. We'll tell Hackenden to use a third model engine, and then refit. Oh, I'm gonna have to do this all individually. Okay, I'm going to replace all the parts individually. I'll be back. Right. Okay, I've replaced all of Hackenden's parts individually. I've given him a third model engine, which is slower than Coulthard's fourth model engine. So Coulthard should win the race, but. Another thing, one of the issues I've had is Hakkinen used a first model engine and as we discovered <laughs> to horrific circumstances in Malaysia last year the newer model engines are more fuel efficient so we can't go off Hakkinen's average fuel a lap data we have to go off of Coulthard's so with how much fuel actually we'll, well no because Hakkinen, oh we'll have to give Hakkinen more fuel We'll give him loads more fuel, because I have no idea how much he's going to use. Well, it's going to be less than 3.56, but more than 3.32. We'll, we'll give Hakkinen loads of fuel just to be safe. And also another issue is Hack. Oh, okay, you can't see it now, but Hakkinen, he had... Because Hakkinen, I mean, if you look at the front and rear wing, Hakkinen demanded he only wanted f such low front and rear wing setups. And he, in fact, told me to lower the rear wing setting even more than it already is. But it's because he's used so many different engines, he doesn't really know what a perfect setup is. But I don't want to upset the guy, because he's very important to the team. So I'm just going to give him what he wants. That's why I've always have done this series. That's, I think, what the perfect setup is. That's what Coulthard says he wants. He said he's fine with that. That's perfect, but... I mean, the Hackner might be using a bad setup. I honestly don't know. And this is by no means done by me personally. Like, I asked for, t I asked you guys want me to do team orders. People conclusively said no. But I mean, someone suggested. I think it might have been Deep Mad Ninety Six actually suggested I should make Hackner start from the back of the grid. I'm not going to do that 
But genuinely, this was not fixed. This is just something that happened. Hacken had an engine failure. And he, he's actually... His race is now severely hampered. But, well, I mean, anyway... We'll just have to see how the race goes. So, Hakkinen is starting... F uh, this isn't a normal thing. I mean, what's... That cheeky arrows! That cheeky, cheeky arrows of Gen A! Oh, okay, fair enough. If, that, if, that's, if that's Gen A... That's Gen A who's holding up David Coulthard right now. Let's have a look at this. I mean, we've seen this a few times, a uh, few times this series where cars at the back have gone to the front of the field. It's happened a few times, but look, Gen A. If it was a Lacey, I would have been angry. But look, I mean, well, I am angry, but I admire Gen A. He's been able to break the game and cheat so much. And as a former Minardi driver. I'm I'm ecstatic. I mean, look look at the train he's holding up. It's Coulf Coulthard is still stuck behind Gene. This is ridiculous. Look, oh Gene's just let Barrichello through, and has held up Coulthard. And what was looking like a perfect race for Coulthard has now turned to a disaster of a race. He's let Frentzen pass. No, Frentzen's into second. That's Schumacher he let past. Oh, Gene has caused all sorts of hysteria this race. And I'm annoyed because he's ruined Coulthard's chances of a race win. I mean, what's going on? But Gene, because only because he's a former Minardi driver, and because he's been able to do something so exceptional, I admire Gene for this. Oh, please tell me Coulthard's going to get past. Oh, I'm sick of looking at these replays. Please tell me Coulthard, he's moved... Up into the outside lane. Please tell me Coulthard's going to get past Gen 8. There we go. Coulthard is ahead of Gen 8. But that shows you how slow the Arrows is. That's ridiculously slow. I mean... But he's held up Schumacher. That's key. Um, in fact, I think Schumacher's only one place ahead of Coulthard. So we'll have to watch out for that. Look, look at Gen 8. He's been ridiculous, he's been stupid, but purely because he's a Minardi driver and because he's broken the rules in such an, in such an insane way. I admire him. I mean, as I say, this isn't the first time this has happened. I think it happened in Italy last year. And it may well have happened, I think it's happened a couple of other times this series. But, wow. I mean, Hakkinen straight away. The only two people that can really rival Hakkinen for pace is Coulthard and Schumacher. And they've both been held up by that. And I think, I think that Benetton that we were watching there, Barrichello, I think he is now leading a train which has got Schumacher and Coulthard in. So now, Barrichello is holding up Schumacher and Coulthard. And this is one exceptional... I, I, I love F1 Manager. I love it when it does stupid stuff that would never happen in real life F1. Like the guy who qualified last going to the front, which happened occasionally. Uh, or teams making stupid driver announcements or Benetton Sports Systems. I love it when the game does it because this game, you have to admit, is not a deep simulation game. So when it's if it's if you have a simulation game, you either make it really deep in depth and realistic, or you do what this game has done inadvertently, accidentally, you do what this game's done and create a game which is so broken and so preposterous that it just becomes hilarious to watch. Wow. I mean, I mean, look, Coulthard's down in 12th. Okay, 11th now, but still. 10th. Wow, he's making up places rapidly, so when we're not looking, I'll well, tell Coulthard, we'll just... He's up in the 6th. Yeah, now it's going to be difficult for him to get past the next cars. Um, oh, no, 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 okay, scrap that. Frenson's in 2nd, that's not going to last much longer. Yep. Coulthard's got past Frentz now. Coulthard is catching up on Hackenden. Not that quickly. I mean, Hackenden's got a power disadvantage and potentially a setup disadvantage. But, I mean, that was Hackenden's own doing. But, I mean, Jenny's four laps behind Hackenden. 
this is what I mean. This this game isn't a deep simulation game. Which, which if you can't make a deep simulation game, then you have to make a hilarious game. And this game is the funniest, most entertaining thing to watch I've ever seen. I love it purely for that reason. But anyway, uh, Coltfard, he's going into the pits. Okay, that's that could be what decides this. Um, or no, because Coltfard's now twelve seconds behind. No worries. Um, okay, so Panis is out of suspension failure, so's Lamarie, Sarazan's out of a tyre failure, and Alacy out of a driver error. Um, and so's Verts, he's also out of a driver error. Oh god, ton- Not again! Not Frensen, with another car failure! This is ridiculous! How- I've said it time and time before, how can Ferrari only build one reliable car? How can Frensen not finish a race? A few of the retirements have been driver errors, but I bet you the car would have broken inevitably. Another engine failure for Frensen. This is beyond unacceptable. I mean, this is inexcusable. I mean, does Frensen have rights to sue? Can, can he sue Ferrari? I mean... This is stupid. Frensen, Frensen was in second. He was ahead of. He was ahead of Coulthard. He was ahead of Schumacher. Oh, this is ridiculous. And Frensen's a proven good driver. I mean, when he came into the sport in the mid '90s, Frensen was, I believe, the most highly rated youngster at the time. Oh no. Hacken's out for suspension failure. Okay, well, Kulvar's cool been gifted the win, but I mean, he was catching up on Hakkinen, but I didn't want to see Hakkinen go out of a suspension failure. I mean, this race, from what I remember, was quite crazy um, in 2000 and in 99. I think in 99, only eight guys finished. I'll tell you what, at the minute, it's looking like we're going to have even less people finish. Sala out of a driver error, so Stephen Watson out with a driver error. Um, but Kulvar, cool he's way ahead of everyone else, so that's... Who else retired then? Oh, okay, that's Ralph Schumacher with an engine failure. So much as super techs. Um, oh, wow, what a, what a race this has been. One of the most exciting this series. Um, where is... Okay. Fizzy Calava, no, wow, with a suspension failure. Okay, Trulli could get another podium. He hasn't done that since Monaco. And Trulli, we thought he was good. We thought he was bad. I mean, Trulli, we don't know. We thought he was exceptional in Monaco. Then he fell off the pace. Now he's been the only guy to keep his car on the track. Well, not the only guy, but one of a few. Um, but this man right here, Coulthard, who's a bit lucky in terms of car failures. I mean, Hakkinen suffered one, but... I mean, Hakkinen, did you... I mean... You will have seen the stupid demands Hakkinen was making for his car setup. It was ridiculous. Like, Hakkinen was demanding... I think Hakkinen was basically asking for his rear wing to be taken off his car. I mean, last time that happened, or the only time I ever know that happening in F1 was Jochen Rin, and we all know what happened there, which was um, his unfortunate death, although I also believe that was due to a drive shaft error, but... Mm. But anyway... Moving away from that, that's a bit of a touchy subject. David Coulthard dominated this race. He was quicker than his teammate, and sure, Coulthard did have a massive advantage, but Coulthard knew how to set up a car, which Hakkinen seemed to completely lose the ability to do this race. And, wow, what an exciting race. He was completely screwed over by the former Minardi driver of Genet, but I'll tell you what, I applaud Genet for doing that, because he's proven how good of a driver Coulthard is, and he's also made the race exceptionally exciting, Coulthard's going to win the 2001 German Grand Prix. David Coulthard takes the chequered flag and wins, wins, wins in Germany. Well, Coulthard, he's been very unlucky this season. But there you go, Coulthard. Amazing drive. So there you go, he's in first. Two, Coulthard is two laps ahead of Schumacher. Wow, Damon Hill is actually battling... With Trulli for the last podium spot. Villeneuve's out of a suspension failure. 
Uh, we could see the Sauber of Pedro Dines getting the points. That hasn't been a common sight. Michael Schumacher is in second place. I uh, want to see what's going on here. Oh no, okay, we've missed it. Trulli in third, that means Damon Hill. Where's Damon Hill? Where is he? Damon Hill, there we go, our former driver. And, you know, he was, he was worse than Mika Salo um, in 2000. But, I'll tell you what, this year, when they've both been in the Stewarts, they've been more evenly matched. And Damon Hill, credit to him, he's going to get fourth place. I mean, well done to him. Anyway, um, Damon Hill will get 4th, Eddie Irvine should get 5th, that's good for Irvine, um, yep, and Barrichello in 6th, um, so yeah, the Salve of Dinners did just miss out on the points, as did Zanardi, but, actually, again, much like the 2000 race, and why I remember was very good for the Brits, we had uh, Damon Hill, Johnny Herbert, Neil McEwen, all finishing in the points. I believe someone else did. Another Brit did. Maybe it was... Um, maybe it was Irvine? Who finished in the points then? I don't know. But today, again, another good race of the Brits. While we haven't got an EA employee winning like we did in 2000, um, we got Coulthard winning, Michael Schumacher second, Jana Trulli third, and then we got the two Brits of Damon Hill in fourth, Eddie Irvine fifth, and then... Rounding off the points, Rubens Barrichello in the Benetton. That's one of the best races this season. I would say, I would say, maybe fifth best race we've had this entire series, I'd say. Malaysia last year was exceptional. Um, all three of the San Marino Grand Prix were exceptional, especially the first two. Um, as you know, this year's is a bit dull in comparison, but... Anyway, David Coulthard wins at Germany, Hockenheim. And I'll tell you one thing. Mercedes are going to be happy to see that. Mercedes may well be bowing out of Formula 1 entirely from next year. So, at least Mercedes can end on a high. They've won their home race. Although, obviously, we will be going to Nürburgring very soon. Hope, well, come the end of the season, hopefully we'll be able to win there. But then again, Nürburgring in 1999 was our most successful race. So... We should be able to, and in the tech race, very much between uh, Ferrari and McLaren, actually. Because everything we're leading in, apart from the chassis, is something that's supplied to us. So, hey, and Stefano Domenico, Carly, 3 million prize money, there you go. Let's have a look at the championship standings. Hakkinen is still leading it. Only just, but Hakkinen is still, well, only just, you know, I mean, he's, he's only got... Just over double the points of Schumacher. It's a nice margin. But Coulthard is three points off Schumacher. Hopefully Coulthard can get past Schumacher. Constructors Championship. Well, we're dominating the Constructors. I mean, we might already have won the Constructors. Right, now let me, let me check and see if we've won the Constructors. I'm going to do the maths now. Okay, now I've worked out, theoretically, we could still lose the Constructors' Championship, but that would rely on Frentzen scoring, scoring some points, which we all know isn't going to happen. Look, Frentzen, still there with no points in the Ferrari. And he was, as I was saying, he was one of, I believe, one of the youngest, hottest talents in the mid-90s when he came into F1. Now look at him. Anyway, guys, sorry for that cut. But next time out, we'll be at the Hungara Ring Circuit, which on paper isn't the best track for us. I guess it does rely a lot on chassis, um, on chassis, rather, should I say. And we've got the best chassis on the grid. So I guess in that respect, it plays to our advantages quite nicely, as well as the fact we've still got Hakkinen on a slightly less powerful engine. He's going to have to use that for qualifying. I mean, I don't care. He's going to use that engine for qualifying. Um, yeah, and I'll replace Hackner's... I won't replace his suspension now. Um, but yeah, Hungar Ring should be a very interesting race. I mean, Germany was amazing. Um, hopefully Hungar Ring will be. So, I'll see you guys for that episode. Which will be coming out on Saturday, the usual time that you see these videos. So yeah, I hope you guys look forward to it. So I'll see you then.